Hey, 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 everybody. Welcome to episode two of Full Exposure with your host, me, Brian Kelly. This episode features Gracie Harkama. Do you guys like beer? Do you more specifically like Founders Beer? which is uh, everywhere around the world now, it seems, but it started here in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And Gracie Harkema is the new director of diversity and inclusion for Founders Brewery. But more on Gracie in a minute. I have to say that episode one went out the door just a few days ago, and I'm super kind of overwhelmed with the response that has come back to me because it's mostly been positive and very reinforcing. So, uh, you know, I have no idea. The world does not need another podcast. Gosh knows, you don't need to hear my voice. But some people have even said, why are you doing a podcast? Why? There's so many. And I just have to say, you know what? Just from my little corner of the world... In my experience over 20 years of being a professional photographer is that some really great conversations start while I'm shooting somebody's portrait or working with them on set. And, you know, that's fun. But then the shoot ends and then the conversation stops and you never get back to it. And I'm always photographing interesting people and I'm running across some of the most uh, unusual or intelligent, or whatever, you fill in the blank, but it's just a kind of an interesting view of the world that a photographer has. So uh, this Full Exposure podcast allows me to sit down and extend those conversations after we finish our shoot. So for one, I just get to take portraits of people, which I love to do in my studio, and then we get to chat longer, and you get to be a fly on the wall. I don't know. What are you complaining about, people? It's free. I, I, what is this? I sound like Mark Marin right now. I have no idea why. Ah, whatever. So uh, I did want to share one thing before I tee up Gracie's podcast. Is I did get a lot of positive reinforcement from people. And uh, especially there was one letter. Uh, Not really a letter. It was more of an instant message uh, on Facebook. So uh, I didn't expect to get this type of email from the first uh, from the first episode. But uh, let me just read it to you, and I'll protect this person's anonymity. Okay. It says, "Dear Brian, I really had loved your podcast with the other Brian. I'm going through a hard time right now, emotionally and financially." But in the midst of my life being otherwise pretty amazing, listening to the two of you guys talk about the balance in your lives between art and paying the bills, the self-deprecation, the process, I can't put it into words, but it was really helpful to hear. It found me at the right time, so I guess I'm saying you should probably do the second episode. Cheers, man. Well, cheers back to you, sir. And with that, we'll get back to episode two and Gracie Harkama. I've known Gracie a long time. I didn't know Gracie very well. She's someone I saw quite frequently around town, but never really had a long sit-down conversation. Um, She's somebody that I saw a long time ago. She was fresh out of college as a receptionist at Varnum Law, which is a big law firm downtown Grand Rapids, when I used to come up there and do portraits of attorneys and other types of marketing materials I'd create for them. And she's always this uh, beaming, smiling, super friendly person on the 17th floor overlooking Grand Rapids. And she always made me feel special and warm. And now look at her. She's got an amazing job, Founders Brewery. And as you'll find out, she's got an amazing history. Uh, She was born in a mud hut in the Republic of Congo. And at one point, she was so sick as an infant, she was given about 12 to 24 hours to live. She lived and survived. And she's, uh, you know, as if that isn't suspenseful and uh, crazy enough, she's gone on to do amazing things. Until just a few years ago, she thought her birth mother was dead. She grew up her whole life and... 
never thought that her birth mother was alive in the Congo. And she tells that story. And holy cow, is that interesting and amazing and emotional. It's crazy. And now at Founders Brewery, she's bringing a whole, a um, whole, um, all, gosh darn it, all kinds of stuff to Founders Brewing. So with that, here's my interview, our podcast with Gracie Harkema. She also takes a mighty fine portrait. I really, really like the portraits that we did together. So uh, enjoy this episode, and we'll see you on the flip side. You ready? I'm ready for this. Let's do it. Gracie Harkema, how are you? Hey, Brian. I'm excellent. How are you doing? Man, I'm so glad that you could come. Thanks for having me. This is great. You know, it's funny because I've known you, we were just talking earlier, but we've actually known each other a long time, but yeah. not but not that well. That's true. Mm-hmm. And I first remember seeing you at Varnum, where you were a receptionist. Yeah. And Varnum's a big law firm here in Grand Rapids, and I used to come up and shoot portraits of attorneys and different types of marketing materials for them in photography, and you'd always be this bright light at the reception desk. <laughs> so nice. So kind, so positive, and I've always remembered you because I would actually look forward to coming back, and some days you weren't there, and then I would be like, I forget the other receptionist's name that was there, but Sheila, right? Yes, yes. How about that? (laughs) That's like 13, 14 years ago. But uh, I would be like, oh, Gracie's not here today. And I would be like, kind of like, oh, you know, because it was always my anchor point on the 17th (laughs) floor, you know? But tell me a little bit about uh, just, you know, that, t- that time uh, leading into your work at Varnum. It's like, take, take us back a little bit. You're, you're working very, very extensively now in, in diversity and inclusion. But I kind of want to hold off on that for a second. Okay. Mm-hmm. And get back to just take me as a West Michigan person. And then we'll talk more about your story, which you're not a West Michigan person per se. <laughs> your story is so amazing. But tell me about your normal sort of upbringing in West Michigan. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, you know, Varnum was one of my first my first jobs. And um, before I was able to work, um, before I got my green card and, and it enabled me to work, I was always, I always loved downtown Grand Rapids. And Varnum, you know, the Varnum building uh, was an iconic building. Every every time we drive through, my family and I would drive through downtown, I always said to my parents, one day I'm going to work downtown and I want to live downtown. And I just loved the vibe. You know, I was always a big city girl. I loved the energy. Yeah. And uh, when the opportunity came about, uh, after I graduated from high school, my parents had uh, a friend who worked at Varnum. I came in to have lunch with her and I, I told her I, I want to work downtown. Mm-hmm. I didn't have any job experience at all, but I knew that I loved people and uh, I wanted to be a part of corporate America. Yeah. So it was a great opportunity to be able to get my foot in the door and, and learn about uh, the nitty gritty of yeah. corporate America. For sure. And the legal, you know, that's a good spot because they had a very, very, um, you know, they had a front row seat and window to all of Grand Rapids. The weather, everything, just you're so perched up on the city along the river. Yes. It, was, it is one of the coolest offices to work in, I think. It is neat. I agree. And, but take us back to even, so we're like West Michigan, you're a West Michigan girl, at least to some extent. Mm-hmm. But uh, you grew up where? What part, of, what part of Grand Rapids did you grow up in? Yeah, so originally... Um, all the way back, I'm, I'm from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. I was trying to save that, but anyway, you go oh, for it. I'm sorry. You're good, you're good. <laughs> I was going to pick it up as like this West Michigan girl, uh, but no, there's a whole We, we can come back to that yeah, later. Yeah, we'll come back. So, it's uh, a major turning yeah. point, yeah. yeah <laughs> I yeah. grew up in, in Grand Rapids. I uh, grew up in the Granville School District, but in the city of Grand Rapids. And so it was a very um, homogenous city, not, not very diverse at all, um, but... The way of of how I felt that I could fit in was getting involved with sports. And so essentially, since I could walk, I always had a ball near me, either at my foot or in my hands. And I played soccer. I played soccer most of my whole life and uh, did well. I was a goalie. Uh, It wasn't my first choice initially, but my dad uh, somehow convinced me at a young age that if I was a goalie, that's how I would learn to be brave and be confident Essentially, he was right. So 
I uh, also had quite a kick being a goalie. That's primarily all you do is kick and catch. Yeah, just launch it. <laughs> yeah. So uh, moving in, in high school, uh, I was involved with a lot of extracurricular activities in high school. Um, anything I could be involved with, I wanted to be a part of it. I've always been very social. And uh, I played in the girls' powder puff game, the football game. And it, I really wanted to be a quarterback. You know, I wanted to be the one that scored the points and, uh, you know, got the touchdowns. But someone saw me kick, and apparently I had a great kick, and I was the kicker in powder puff. And the, the refs of the powder puff game were the men's varsity coaches. And after the game, the, the men's varsity coaches asked if I would try out for the men's varsity team. And I, I couldn't believe it. You know, initially I was just thinking, oh, this is crazy. No girl has ever played before. Yeah, um, for sure. <laughs> I, I don't want to be that girl. Um, but I also realized what the opportunity was to do something that hadn't been done before and how cool that would be and to help be a role model for other girls uh, and help pave the way. Yeah. So I tried out for the team. I made it. It was an incredible experience. It certainly helped uh, my my school experience and growing up and to then, you know, being in this uh, homogenous city, I was no longer known for being, um, you know, one of the only few black people in the school. I was known for being the girl who was the kicker yeah. on the varsity guys team. Yeah, it's like... And who wouldn't want that necessarily? I mean, it's kind of like, well, she's the athlete on the on the boys' team. Yeah. I mean, which is kind of like a, a really unique pr- way for people to look at you other than your your ethnicity, you know, or whatever right, it might right. be, your race. Um, but talk a little bit about more, I don't want to cut that off necessarily, but I think there's a good foundation to getting back now to the Congo Mm -hmm. and how you got here and your parents, your adoptive parents and your mom. But, like, tell me, so uh, the Republic of Congo, as I had to look it up because I know it's in Africa, but, like, all those countries, for most Americans, I'm being everyday (laughs) American now, not geographically kind of illiterate in some parts of the world. But it's in the uh, kind of at the center lower part of the country, and it's a huge country. Very large, yes. So I was born in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, in a mud hut. And so typically how I describe it to Americans is kind of think of jungle. Um, It it really wasn't rainforest jungle. It was mountains. But when Americans think of mountains, typically they think of, you know, skiing and and Colorado. But it wasn't that sort of mountain scene. Yeah. And um, so it was very remote. My biological mother was young and very poor and dying from disease and malnutrition when I was born. And she had two children previous to me who were born who died shortly after birth from disease and malnutrition. Mm -hmm. And she didn't want that to happen to me. So when I was a week old, she brought me to an orphanage that was nearby. When I arrived to the orphanage, uh, I was very, very sick. I had four different diseases, and the orphanage workers had given me 12 to 24 hours to live. Wow. And uh, they they didn't want me to be near the other babies and risk getting them sick or worse, risk me dying. So uh, one of the the daughters of an orphanage worker had a toy set, a toy doll set. So instead of putting me in a crib, since I was only three pounds, they put me in this toy doll set in the back of the orphanage so I'd be away from people, um, and it was outside of the bathrooms. So I was there. And coincidentally, two hours after I arrived to the orphanage, an American missionary family from Grand Rapids happened to be visiting the orphanage on their day off. Wow. They, they had four kids that were grown. They weren't planning on adopting. Uh, but before they left, the woman, uh, the mother of the family, had to use the bathroom. So she cut to the back of the orphanage, and she saw me there laying in this, in this dull set and uh, what's amazing at three pounds, you you know, if they were in a, if that same child you had been in a larger city uh, a hospital, you had been in a NICU. You know what I mean? Right. Like, you mm-hmm. know, three. Uh, it's a tiny, tiny little creature you were. Yes. Yes. I was also a preemie. Yes. yes. So she she saw me there and thought, oh, Amy has a new doll, and Amy was one of the the daughters of one of the workers there at the orphanage. And then she came out of the bathroom, and my head moved. 
And she was very perplexed, you know, why is this doll's head moving? And she touched my forehead, and in that moment, she heard a voice in her head say, this is your daughter. She uh, had a, a, a piece about it in her spirit and knew that and this I is was not hers. Your, just to be clear, it's not your, your, your natural mother. This is a, a woman who was just a missionary Correct. who had popped in, and she felt so uh, moved when she saw you that she knew that she had to care for you in that moment, right? Correct, yes. And there was nothing, she didn't have any previous ties to me or um, her and her husband weren't planning on adopting. It was just, it happened in that exact moment. Amazing. It is. Then uh, she told her husband uh, that they were being called to adopt me and he had a piece about it as well. And they brought me home that same day to their their home uh, in a nearby village in the Congo. I didn't have any medical care as there weren't any doctors or hospitals around. And uh, they just loved on me and held me and uh, hoped and prayed that the next day I'd still be alive. And the next day I was alive. And the day after that I was alive. And the day after that I was alive. Wow. So you lived then in the Congo with your parents getting stronger for a period of years and becoming, I'm sure, you know, a normal kid with parents mm-hmm. there that are missionaries and growing up. And then at what point do you get to the States and um, where do you land, you know? How, yeah. how old are you when you left the Congo? Yeah, so we moved, we moved from the Congo when I was almost four. We moved, back, we moved to Grand Rapids, Michigan. And the reason of why we moved uh, the area, I'm from the city of Bukavu, which is on the border of the Democratic Republic of the Congo and Rwanda. And uh, during that time, so this is close to, this is the late 80s, um, it it wasn't a safe area. Uh, Fast forward a few years, you know, 1994 was the peak of the Rwandan genocide Mm -hmm. where a million men, women, and children were killed based on tribal identity. Yeah. And so there were riots that that were breaking out before it turned into a genocide and since my parents were from Grand Rapids and uh, my siblings had gone to school in Grand Rapids when they were younger, my parents really wanted me to have an American education and, and mm-hmm. also for us to be safe uh, away from the riots and the war that was about to happen yeah. and also have family sur- surrounded by us as sure. well. So how many other siblings do you have? I have four siblings who are older. All older. And um, are any of them adopted by your parents? They're not. Okay. Nope. I'm the only one who's adopted. Awesome. And then, so you start to assimilate here in Grand Rapids. Yes. Mm-hmm. And um, as you mentioned, you grow up. You're one of the few minorities in your school system yes. in that community. And I grew up in kind of a similar, on the other part of town, Northview School District. You went to Granville. Correct. Mm-hmm. And kind of similar. We didn't have very many minorities um, I think in my whole class there was maybe four. Wow. You know, of 200. We weren't as big as Granville in the 80s when I grew up. But the, um, you know, it's certainly as a, as a guy growing up on the northeast side and as I got older, I became, and I got more exposed to more people and moved out and shared some different employment experiences, everything. I, mm-hmm. You really do have kind of a blind spot around... Um, just that lack of diversity, and and um, I, I and I'm speaking from someone who learned that gradually. But you had you carried that with you every day from the outside, you know, kind of back at you in terms right. of like carrying this identity. You know, you're with a you, your parents are white, your siblings are white, mm-hmm. and and you're in a very um, you know basically w- white school system. How did you carry that and? Positive or negative, whatever it might have been. Yeah, great question. Um, it was tough. And it, it wasn't tough in the sense of every day I woke up thinking, oh, this is really hard. Um, because I, I have this innate sense of gratitude. And so even though I knew uh, the situation that it appeared, I knew, I always knew that I, was, that I looked different. Uh, I never had that feeling of feeling like I completely fit in uh, at that point. Um, I later then learned to to have that sense and to feel like I fit in and that I belong. 
Um, so it was this interesting dichotomy of being so grateful just to have life because I always knew of my background. My parents were always very transparent, very open with me about my adoption and, and how they found me. And I, I, since from a young age, I knew that this was an opportunity to be here, to have breath, to live that I wasn't supposed to have. Yeah. So I was so grateful, but also it was, it was really difficult to just feel like I fit in. And so I think that's why my personality was, has always been to be social and to be outgoing. I felt like uh, my social self had to make up for feeling like I didn't fit in and I almost had to just make friends, you yeah. know, and and put myself out there. And I think that's why I was quick to do audacious things like played on the men's varsity football team. Which for um, any person, <laughs> any woman, female, you know, it's be an amazing accomplishment, but also uh, ground setting. It would have its own pushback and in, in its own way if you're like making a, a movie about it. You know, there'd be some... <laughs> trials and some bully boys, you know, saying, right. girl, get off the team. And, and there, you know. there was, yeah. yeah. But, yeah. but I think I, I preferred to have that than uh, I, I preferred to be bullied or have uh, people not being in support of me because of the act of what I was doing rather than the identity of who I was. And that's amazing that that would push you. It almost pushes you, it pushes you through courage, but it also pushes you almost into more potential confrontations or more, um, more danger is the wrong word maybe, but the mm -hmm. more you're kind of putting yourself more at risk, you're putting yourself out there, you're putting yourself there, there socially, athletically, the groundbreaking leadership's yeah. kind of position where people are paying even more attention to you um, in some ways. So I think it speaks to something, I, my impression is that it's... Um, I don't know the right way to say it, but other than just it, it speaks to something in you that you would project yourself outward even more mm -hmm. as a way to almost layer and further protect yourself. Yes, it definitely was. It, it certainly was my um, defense mechanism, if you will. And others didn't see it at, that way. Um, but for me, it made me feel, even though I was putting myself out there more and drawing more attention, both positive and negative, it helped me feel like I fit in yeah. more. And yeah. it helped me feel like I was creating this space and uh, it's in, in essence being a trailblazer. And me being a trailblazer in that regard made me feel more protected and safe mm -hmm. uh, and also helped be a role model for others who might have felt similar or might have felt like they couldn't do something because of whatever their background was. Yeah. And... Uh, and I, it was almost like I had this sense of responsibility to help protect others, and I didn't want people to feel the way that I felt. Yeah. You know what I find, though, is that, that I think what you're speaking about is, is in part empathy for others. Yes. But it's uh, the coolest people I meet through photography or just people in my life tend to be people who have had some type of crisis. They've had, yeah. they've had some shit thrown at them. They've had to duck and weave and move through life a little bit. Hasn't been fair. Hasn't necessarily been uh, them getting the perfect uh, cards, you know, of life dealt to them. But they have a, a temper, you know, they're tempered like glass and strengthened in some way. But at the same time, they have what you said at the beginning of this little talk or, you know, about gratitude. Mm -hmm. You almost died. You shouldn't be alive. And there's part of that that, like, you carry with you is just like you've already won. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, like how bad can it get into some degree where, um, and I think people that have had weathered some crises and had some things that were happened to them of which they had no control over, um, they are sometimes the most centered, beautiful, empathetic, helpful, generous people I've ever met. And I've done it through photography projects and people I've just met, and you, you, you wonder why there's some connection with people even when you meet them after a minute or two. Oh, and mm -hmm. then later through talking, you figure out, oh, well, they've, they've got some miles on them, you know, in their <laughs> life. They've lived it, and they've got some dust on them, and I like that, you know, and they, um, they've taken that, whatever that crisis was, and turned it into positive energy and acceptance of others because you don't know 
what journey other people have been on. True. And so you kind of like give people a, well, maybe they're having a bad day, you know, or like, you know, <laughs> if someone's not necessarily, you know, you're, you're not, you're less inclined to be like uh, offended or th- taken aback, you know, you just kind of can roll with it a bit. Was that, is that, am I sort of parroting out what you believe in yes, some de- definitely. degree? Because, um, yeah, I mean, if you sweat, if you're always sweating the small stuff, uh, you know, you become kind of a stressed out minute to minute person because there's no days perfect, you know? Right, right. I agree. And a lot of, I mean, I think a lot of where my empathy comes from is, you know, current state when people meet me who, who don't know my background, they assume that I've had this easy life and everything was handed to me and I don't have to worry about day-to-day things. Um, but that's also because they didn't, they didn't know. And, and the same goes to when I meet people, I can't assume that I know and I don't know what their journey is and we all have a journey. And so the empathy comes in where I, you know, I always seek to give grace and understanding um, before being judgmental. Obviously, I'm human and I make mistakes, but uh, I always have that in the forefront of my mind. I think mind. you were judging how long it took us to set up the audio for this <laughs> first time. I was we're not little... judging. I'm impressed by this <laughs> setup. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Sorry. But, um, but yeah, I think you, you give people, uh, you give them a minute, you know, to sort of reveal themselves. Uh, I, I'm kind of, I'm a photographer, but I'm, I'm a visual person, so I sort of, at the same time I'm engaging with someone, I'm, I'm also kind of watching yes. and feeling from them, you know, like what's their energy or what, what is this like or what is that like? And it's, it, it'll often change, you know, throughout a portrait sitting or a client meeting. I but, bet. You know, trying to just, you know, I don't know if I like the phrase take the temperature of the room, you know, but I mm-hmm. feel like in life I'm just trying to get a handle of what the temperature is for your, what's your mood and that person's mood and then figuring out how to like flow within that. But I think in your job, and I hate to, maybe this isn't the best segue, but I think um, I'm really interested in your current professional role, but maybe I'm an awful first time podcaster, but so I just want to I want to get through this growing up and you go to mm-hmm. college mm-hmm. and then you start your professional career and I know you went to Grand Valley. What did you study in Grand Valley? I studied uh, communications with a focus of public relations and advertising. And what what was your dream at 2021? 20, My dream at that time was to move to New York City and work in advertising. Yeah, uh, I big love, swing, right? Yes. Take a big <laughs> bite out of the apple. Exactly. Yeah. I, I was always a fan of TV commercials. Yeah. Um, for the aspect that I liked the psychology behind it, of how you have 30 seconds or less to portray something that will convince the viewers that they need that something. Yeah. Um, and that was beautiful to me. So I, I was interested in psychology uh, as a science, um, but I, but, but more so the consuming, the consumer buying power yeah. behind that psychology. Oh my gosh, you could be my daughter Hannah in front of me now because she's very interested in marketing and advertising. She just declared a communications major. <laughs> she's at uh, University of Michigan, and she people are always asking her, "So what are you studying?" Or they ask me, "What is Hannah interested in?" I was like, "Well, it's marketing and advertising, but she's really more interested in like human behavior and what." Uh, you know, how brands and campaigns are, how they are successful or unsuccessful in pushing those buttons to get oh, you to buy great. something mm-hmm. or the strategy or the, the human psychology behind all media, right? To, yeah, it's fascinating. To listen, yeah. And so it's fascinating that you have that background. And my daughter talks about this all the time. And she's, I'm here about her classes. And I'm always very interested because I am too, because I'm in that field of advertising mm-hmm. and marketing and corporate communications. And, you know, uh, you can put a lot of stuff out there, but if it doesn't have a response that's intended or you can't drive the response that you want, you know, you're missing the marks. And it's all about human, it's all about, you know, human behavior and reception at that point. Yes. So you are wrapping up Grand Valley, big dreams for advertising. And then um, what happened after you graduated um, and where did you start in that field? Yeah. 
Well, I graduated in 2009. It was not the best time for the economy. Perfect. (laughs) Right. Get a degree, head out into the 2009 economy, Gracie. Good luck to you. (laughs) Right, exactly. And it also was an even worse time to get into advertising and to move to a city like New York City. Uh, But luckily, I was still working at Varnum at the time. And so it was an an excellent uh, safety net, if you will, that I was still able to gain more experience uh, in the corporate aspect where then I went from being a receptionist to also helping out on marketing projects. Mm -hmm. Uh, I helped out at client events. I also helped out in human resources projects. And so I ended up staying at Varnum until 2011. So I was there for about seven and a half years and gained a lot of experience, especially being so young. Yeah. Yeah, it's not um, because there are most attorneys and paralegals there and you know, they tend to be older already. They've already gone to school in a million years, you know, <laughs> and they're in their 30s when they really get going. And then, you know, um, so it's an older environment. You, f- you were it a was. young person working in a, 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 a more mature workplace. Mm-hmm. And, um, but to have that experience to sort of dabble, Varm's a huge firm, but also to be, to work internally in so many departments had to be a great resource for you. It was incredible, yes, working with, those who are much more experienced than I is. I had a lot of partners and a lot of other leaders in the law firm that took me under their wing. That gave me the exposure of going to different client events. Uh, I got to meet amazing people like you. Uh, I got to meet a lot oh, of... You're being way too it's kind. It's true, though. I still have your autograph when I asked you to sign your business card. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I don't know. Yeah. Well, is it framed anywhere? It's, it's going to be. It's not framed currently. I'll and frame it for you. Perfect. It no <laughs> ego involved. No. Uh, I love no. it. No. Um, yeah, go ahead. Tom. Yeah, so it was an incredible opportunity to meet so many leaders uh, within Grand Rapids, and really that's how I learned how to network yeah. and how to get myself out there. And um, but That's what I always remembered about you. You And as I'm learning now more about your just approach to life in high school, junior high. It was to put yourself out there, and that's what I always remember about you. You were always hello, and you remembered <laughs> names, and hi, Brian, and how are you today? And, like, you were there. Like, you, it didn't matter what color you are or were, but uh, you put your, your personality in any package. People are going to remember you <laughs> because of how you engage with people and putting yourself right in front of them, but in such a way that, you know, is kind and warm and memorable and, and genuinely interested in who people are. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. I, uh, I've always been very passionate about people, so that, that means a lot that that's recognized by others as well. Yeah. So, Varnum, you're there for a long time, seven, eight years, right? Correct, yes. And then what is tugging at you to pull out of our Varnum? Or what other opportunity presented itself? Yeah, it was actually kind of a, a freak story. Uh, while I was at Varnum, I... You know, Art Prize, as you know, draws in yeah. thousands of people I'm to Grand Rapids. With that I, think, I think you've taken photos for them before. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was uh, art prizing downtown, and uh, randomly, I was hit and run over by a car, which what? sounds crazy, but it, it turns out to be well. And so I had to go on short term disability from Varnum. I. Uh, had a boot on my on my foot. I Wait, was on what crutches. intersection were you at? I was on Pearl Street by uh, Gerald R. Ford Museum. So Pearl Street in yeah. Mount Vernon, I think that yeah. is the Pearl right Street. there by the on ramp. Yes, yes, much. yep. I didn't know you got hit by a car. Yeah, I, sometimes I forget to mention it. Yeah, um, I mean, but should, you know. that should be like <laughs> top of your list, and Gracie. Got hit and by a I car got hit in by a car. <laughs> but it turned out to be well. Um, so I was on short-term disability. I had crutches. I wasn't able to go back to work uh, at Varnum for a, a set amount of time just because I was in recovery, and I was still seeking more more job experience. You know what I had at Varnum for my first job was absolutely incredible and amazing. But I also wanted to do more and gain more experience. Yeah. So I went to a career fair at DeVos Place. I was on said crutches, had some resumes in my backpack, and I met some people at Farmers Insurance, and they asked, oh, what happened to you? And I said, I was hit and run over by a car. (laughs) 
And their response was, what do you know about claims? And I said, quite a bit. I'm in the middle of a claim right now. Right. And since, you know, it's interesting that when we have these things that seem terrible and unexpected that happen to us, there's a great opportunity that that propels us yeah. for future positivity and future growth. And yeah. that was one of those cases where since I knew a lot about claims going from that experience they basically offered me a job on the spot in auto under auto insurance underwriting. Um, Sounds like a very, very sexy industry. You know, it was. <laughs> Everyone wanted that job. Um, but what it gave me was uh, a more experience that I didn't have. Yeah. Um, and I also needed to, to grow on and... Um, start to make more of a, yeah. an income that and was equivalent to having a good one. I remember that move when you left Varnum. I do remember um, that shift and you working at Farmers. But as I seem to recall, you were there not very long, certainly not as long as you were at Varnum. Right, yes. And then another opportunity, uh, you know, some other things came up. Yeah, so I was there for two years. Um, it, it was not the sexy career that I wanted. But <laughs> Auto it, claims. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, I, but what I learned from that is I learned how to have conversations with people um, that was giving them bad news, but how to work with them through that. And um, having those, those tough spots when people are mad and angry with you, yeah. but not to take it personally. So that yeah. was, was something incredible that I learned there that, that I'll carry with me for the rest of my life. Yeah, and also at the same time, I was. Uh, it must be like really frustrating to be in a relationship with because if you want to be really angry <laughs> at you, you're just like, well, you know. I try. <laughs> I, I like, have had those arguments. Deflecting. Like, why aren't you mad about this? <laughs> I am. I'm understanding what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> I hear you. I hear what you're saying. I'm sorry that happened. Exactly, I'm and I'm sorry, sorry you I, feel that way. I'm so- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, sorry. It got uh, off on so, a so while I was working at. Farmers, and also from my experience at Varnum, Varnum was a corporate sponsor of Blend, which Blend is, a, is still in existence. It's a professional development nonprofit yeah. with a mission like to them. equip young professionals of color in professional development, social networking, yeah. and community outreach. They do a lot of events in town. They do, yeah. yes. So it's an awesome, awesome group. I was on the board for four years. So I got involved with them while I was at Varnum, still was with them when I was at Farmers Insurance, and I was putting on an event, a social networking event, and I met the director of tech systems in Grand Rapids. And he he came to the event, and I asked him, you know, hey, what brings you to the event? You know, I'm inquisitive. I like to learn about people. Mm -hmm. I hadn't heard of tech systems before. And he said, you know, we're we're seeking to... Uh, enhance our diversity and inclusion strategy. And so we're here because we want to start building relationships with diversity organizations in Grand Rapids. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so back up, what is tech, like, what is their industry? Yeah. What so are tech they systems, do? I had never heard of them at that point. And yeah. so, and I'm like, what is tech systems? So tech systems is an IT recruiting and services firm. Mm-hmm. And it's T E K, correct? Correct. Yeah. Yep. They are based in Baltimore. Um, but have 130 offices all across North America, Grand Mm -hmm. Rapids being one of them. And what they do is they support 82% of the Fortune 500 in their IT needs. Okay. So that's everything from staff augmentation, where they're hiring contract resources, Mm -hmm. they hire uh, for on behalf of companies full-time for direct placement, and they also do large IT projects. So instead of a company, let's say, Amazon is going to do a large deployment. Instead of them hiring 100 people for a year and then you know, letting them go, they would utilize a company like Tech Systems to do that project In for them. just that project, take it on. Yes. And yep. become a vendor or essentially a, a third-party yes. vendor to them and but deliver whatever scope of work that is, is correct. needed. Yep. But it was also general recruitment and talent. like Correct, yeah, within IT. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So, um, you know, I was really intrigued with the director of tech systems that they were interested in, in building their diversity and inclusion strategy. And so naturally, just from my background of always feeling like uh, not the majority, yeah. um, I was was really intrigued. And um, because I was already interested in corporate structure and what works and what doesn't work and how to draw in talent for an organization, I told the director that I would research that for him and, and do a presentation about 
best practices of what companies were doing mm -hmm. and how Tech Systems and Grand Rapids could ha implement that strategy. So I came into the office and uh, I thought I was just giving the presentation, so I gave the presentation to him. It turns out it was an interview. I did not realize it was an interview. And one of the questions, Surprise. right, ta-da, you're, you're about being interviewed. Yeah. And I wasn't you know, necessarily looking for another position at that time, um, but I was intrigued by the work of tech systems. I was intrigued by the scope, that they're a global organization and the opportunity that that could lead to. And one of the questions that the director asked me in said interview was, you know, what was, the question was something around, you know, what was, uh, how have you overcome adversity throughout your life? And to that point, I had I'd been keeping a secret um, that I'm gay and I identify as queer and I didn't feel comfortable sharing that professionally ever before. Yeah. Only a few people in my life I'd known and for your, fa your family know? My family did not know okay. at that point. Yeah. And so for some reason, I just felt like I had this connection with him, and I told him, and I came out in that interview. In your job interview. In my job you interview. You came out to one of the few people in the world that knew. <laughs> yes. During your job interview. Yes. And after I said that out loud, I know I, I realized, okay, Gracie, I'm either going to get this job or I'm not going to get this job. <laughs> It's, yeah, it's definitely the, the sea had parted there. It's only going to go one way or the other. Yes, so. and it was a risk, um, but it also in that risk, it was powerful to actually be able to say that out loud, especially to a stranger, yeah. and not be criticized. And his reaction was that he was, he was impressed that I was being my authentic self, and that was the first moment in my life that I was able to be my authentic self. And yeah. that, that was powerful to me. Which it had to be a huge release. It was. And I don't mean relief, but a release in that moment. I'm talking about in the moment. Mm -hmm. And then to be uh, affirmed for right. who you were and are at that moment had to be right. powerful. And his... his uh, More powerful when you got the job. It was very powerful. <laughs> and his reaction to that, that director, his name is Alex Polito, who I'll, I'll always be so grateful for. But in that moment, that's when I, you know, I felt like a superhero. And I realized that the opportunities truly were endless. And so I accepted the offer. I was very excited to be there. Uh, I worked in IT recruiting, um, but it, it was this it was this sense of weight that was lifted off me, and I, I truly felt like I can do anything. Yeah. Whereas before, I felt like I was limited or I just had to, I had to do so much just to feel like I could live. Um, but now, the, then, you know, I felt powerful. Yeah. And so I had worked my way up at Tech Systems. I was there for five and a half years. Well, wait, can we go back five years? Yes, but yes. How, you hadn't come out to your family. Oh, was correct. that a, well, I mean, they're, they were missionaries and, uh, you know, of that time. <laughs> so uh, to the extent that you can or want to talk about it, like tell, tell me more about that process of uh, the next step is like, I can do anything. Right. Uh, and you're living in a, truth now, uh, at least with that employer. Mm -hmm. But what was the process after that? And how soon did you come out to other friends and family? Well, it was a process. Yeah. Yes. Um, it was full of highs and lows. Yeah. So I went from feeling on top of the world and I can do anything and I'm going to scream this from the mountaintops because I was keeping it a secret for you know, 26 years, yeah. essentially. Um, it did not go over well with my family initially, uh, unfortunately. If they're hearing this right now, um, hey, I'm glad we're at where we're at now because I, I love you all. Yeah. But, well, I uh, know they do, and I know they're supportive of you, but I I, I think that I didn't want to jump over that part yeah. to the extent that you want to share it. So. No, that's great. I appreciate you asking. It's it's not something that I I talk about very often. Um, it was a hard time of my life. Yeah. Um, I, I went from the highest of the highs to the lowest of lows. And uh, it was a process for them. You know, they, uh, they took it hard. You know, I think, I think parents don't wish that their child goes through whatever X, Y, Z adversity. And I, I also understand, you know, from their background that they probably had more of a traditional sense of what family structure looked like to them. And... Um, it was difficult, um, but it took some time. 
Um, and uh, in time, they were they ended up being very supportive. Um, but it was like my mom had to have a, a coming to Jesus moment, literally. And she said, uh, when, and she also said to the family, if I'm going to claim to be a Christian, then I need to love and accept you and whomever would be in your life. Sure. And after she said that, it was, it was like a light switch, and they were supportive. Yeah. Um, but it, it took time. And as, as tough as that was now, you know, I, I'm back to feeling like, okay, this is a high point, and I don't have to keep secrets from them anymore yeah. and, or from anyone in my family, and I can be open and transparent and honest. And, and I know that that journey was painful for, for them, um, and, and painful for me to have to keep it a secret as long as I did. Mm-hmm. But our relationships are much stronger now because we are open and we love each other and we're very supportive and uh, are there for each other. Yeah, that's beautiful. But let's get through tech systems and I want to talk about founders and I have to get to your mom. Yeah. Your real mom. We can we can talk about that. Do you want to jump into that now? Yeah. Does that okay. feel like the way to go? Let's yeah. do that. So, so at yeah. yeah, at Tech Systems I uh was in recruiting and sales roles, but was very interested in diversity and inclusion based on, you know, what we had previously spoken about in my previous life experiences. Um but I was approached by a school teacher, uh, her name's Kate Perminsky, and we just met at a bar downtown, and she said, she told me that she was teaching seventh grade social studies, and she was going to be teaching on the Rwandan genocide that next week, and so immediately my ears perk up, and I'm like, oh, wow, I'm from Bukavu, Congo, right next to Rwanda, you know, it's about a half a mile away from Rwanda, and I had known about the Rwandan genocide quite intricately. And she got all excited and said, hey, would you come into my classroom and be a guest speaker to my students to talk about the genocide? And I was like, whoa, pump the brakes. <laughs> no, <laughs> I cannot do that because I was four. Yeah. And I have no recollection or knew that there was a war about to occur. Yeah. However, I said, uh, I can reach out to a friend of the family. Yeah. And I can ask them some questions about the genocide and, and what it was like while they were a kid. And I can share their story. Kate's yeah. like, this is perfect. That'd be great. So uh, remember when I was in the orphanage and I was in that toy doll basket set? Yes. And it was Amy who had that set. Yeah. So I reached out to Amy on Facebook, which it wasn't, it wasn't a weird thing because she was friends on Facebook with my siblings. So it didn't seem like left field. Sure. But even though my message to her was something like, hey, super random, uh, I'm going to do this presentation on the Rwandan genocide. And she was about 10 years old when that happened. And I said, can I interview you about your life and what it was like for you as a child? And can I share your story with these seventh graders? Oh, yeah. She said, yes, that'd be great. So Amy starts talking to me about her life. And um, as a side note, my biological mother's name is Mari Johnny. So I'm interviewing Amy, and I ask her, you know, tell me what you did from the moment you woke up to the moment you went to bed. And Amy says, when I would wake up, I'd pick crops, and I'd hike into the mountains, and I'd bring Mari Johnny food. I'm like, whoa, how did you know Mari Johnny? How did you know my biological mother? Yeah. And she says to me, when your family moved to the U.S., my family helped take care of her because she was so sick. Yeah. And I immediately start sobbing because I didn't know anything about Mari Johnny and yeah. And that was something that I had heard. And you so didn't I, know anyone who had a, or that close a connection no, to your mother. No, I knew nothing. And so then I ask, I ask her, you know, tell me what she was like. And Amy says that uh, my biological mother was really sweet and warm, and she loved people, and she smiled a lot. Big surprise. <laughs> so then I'm, I'm sobbing even more because I, I really do enjoy smiling. Yeah. And, uh, and that's, I knew where I got that from, which I didn't know that before either. And... My whole life, so this is just four years ago, um, I thought my biological mother was dead my entire life. And so I asked Amy of knowing when she died. I, I told her I never had closure of knowing when she died, but I need to know. And Amy says, I'm not sure. It might have been 20 years ago. We've lost touch with her. Amy now lives in Kenya. And she said, but I can ask around to find out. And I said, please ask anyone that you can. I need to know. Sure. So uh, a couple days later, 
it's the middle of the night and my phone is vibrating and I'm thinking, who's trying to contact me right now? And I look at my phone and it's a message from Amy and it's a screenshot of a text between her and her friend who lives in the Congo. And the, the text reads, Amy says, do you know if Mari Johnny is still alive? To her friend. Yeah. And her friend's response is, yes, she is. What? She just, she just ran into me two weeks ago in the village and she came after me asking about her daughter, but I didn't have a clue. Which her daughter was wow. me. All within, like you were on the same wavelength. Yes, we were both asking time. about one another within the same couple of days. Wow. Which was mind blowing, and I couldn't believe it. You know, so I'm, I'm hysterical. I'm sobbing, and I I can't believe it. And so the next day, my friend Kate and I go to my parents' house, and I have to tell them, and I'm I'm nervous. You know, it was I think I was more nervous about telling my parents that my biological mother was alive than I was about telling them that I was gay. And so, <laughs> so I, I told yeah. them, and they were shocked. You know, they thought that she had died as well. But I also I said to my mom and dad that. I, that I needed to go there to the Congo and meet her. And I needed my parents to come with me because I needed, I needed to tell Mari Johnny, thank you for giving me up because her giving me up gave me life. Yeah. And I needed my parents to be there because I needed Mari Johnny to see how much my parents love me and the opportunity of life that I've been given. Yeah. And I'm sure my parents were terrified, but they didn't tell me, so that was good. Yeah. And we, we went there. We flew there within... A few months after that, to meet my, to meet my biological mother in person, and um, I was terrified leading up to it. It was um, I was really nauseous every day. I had high anxiety, yeah. and I'm not an anxious type of person. Yeah, um, but this is you know you're stacking yes, up some it stress was, it on, on, your, on the on the hierarchy of stress on the, your life. I mean, you're you're about to meet your past and your beginning, and right. your and your all the 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 whole through story of your life. Yeah. And I can't imagine what that plane ride was oh like. Oh my goodness. Oh, I was uh I think I was internally a mess. I was I was very quiet on the outside. I I didn't say much for for days. Um the plane the the travel there was 32 hours including layovers yeah. and then uh we my biological mother also didn't know that I was coming to meet her. I didn't have a way to communicate with her because sure. she was living in a mud hut. Yeah. So I couldn't just call her to say, hi, I found out that you're alive and I'm going to stop by yeah, tomorrow. Quick FaceTime call. Right, hey, we're coming right. over. So um, when we got there, it was a few days later after we were in the Congo, we, by word of mouth, were able to find where she was and uh, we coordinated her to come to the hotel that we were staying at. And the word spread across the village, and people wanted to witness this in person. And so there were so many people there, and it was overwhelming. There were, it was just everyone was there. And I didn't want anyone to be there, but they all wanted to be a part of this. Yeah. And so she came in with a group of people, and she was surrounded by people. And no one had to tell me who she was, but the moment that I saw her, I knew her. Yeah. And we both looked into each other's eyes and we just hugged. And the very first thing she said to me in Swahili was, my daughter, my daughter, my daughter. And it was the happiest moment of my life. Yeah. And in that moment, everything made sense. Everything in my whole life made sense and everything was complete. And that was the moment also that I knew who I was and who I was supposed to be and what I would do in the future. And I yeah. knew it would be something great. Yeah. Yeah, that's so powerful. Like, I, oh... I it, just have chills. It was. It was but the, um, unbelievable. Yeah, to meet. So were all these other people part of her, her village or her neighbors? Or how, where are all these other yeah, people that were, sort of surrounded her? There were um, when, friends of hers, yeah. um, distant family members. There were friends of my parents from when we were living there 30 years ago that remembered who our family was, who also wanted to be a part of this. Um, so there were many people who... 30 years ago knew that I was the one who was adopted, but I'm sure they were curious about oh, what happened to her and, and what happened to that family. Sure. And I think people also wanted to witness the love um, that my family and I have, you know, for my parents and then also to see that reunion yeah. with my biological mother. I'm sure she wanted to make sure you felt welcome as well, like, it, you yeah. know, to her world. I think, uh, I have no idea how she felt leading up to that moment, but in that moment she was proud and then I also have two biological brothers that I didn't know that I have. Wow. And I immediately connected to them, too. Yeah. And we, 
just in, in moments, I felt like I was, I was closer to them than I could imagine being closer to other people in my whole life, you know, excluding yeah. my parents. And uh, it was beautiful and it was powerful and special. Um, and, and, and I have to say one thing before we get too far from, from what your mom's first words to you were, but you mm-hmm. have now to me the all-time coolest tattoo I've ever seen. <laughs> when we were doing our, our portrait shoot before the podcast, you know, you mentioned this tattoo and and what it meant. Can you just describe what it what it looks like and yeah. what it means? So on my forearm, which is it's a, a few inches long, it's it's about three or four inches long um, on the outside of my forearm. It takes up about half of my forearm, and it's a voice wave. Um, my dad was recording this as this was happening, and so th- it's the voice wave of the first words that my biological said my biological mother said to me in Swahili: "My daughter, my daughter, my daughter." So I, yeah, it's the coolest tattoo because it sort of looks like a super compressed EKG or just that voice wave you hear when you know you're looking at audio, and it just is all these spikes of her words on your arm now completely part of you as you were part of her yes your her whole life you came from her it's just like the coolest tattoo i've ever seen oh thank you i love it and i wanted it to be in a place that was outwardly visible not just to me but to the world when yeah um because people uh, will ask and you know they'll ask and then you get to talk about your exactly yes it's been a great conversation starter (laughs) (laughs) conversations that turn into drinks that turn into dinners (laughs) That turned into friendship. Usually a quick one. Yeah, a quick <laughs> explanation. Oh yeah, I got that a couple months ago. <laughs> it means, and then you're on to the next subject. But it makes me, it makes me so happy. And so, um, the moment I'll come back to this tattoo. So, that was the happiest moment of my life. And um, we were, you know, we, we it came time. You know, we had to say goodbye, and we're we're hugging. And I just, I, I needed. I knew that I, I needed her to continue to be in my life, but I also didn't know when I would see her again. And my, my biological brother, my older one, had a cell phone. And we exchanged phone numbers. And, um, you know, they leave, and then we, we fly out of the Congo. And a, a few days later, I get a text message from him. And in his text message, he said, uh, that Mari Johnny was doing well, and he said, "We thank God for you. You came here to save us." Really? And I thought, I, you know, I thought I was going there for for my own uh, closure and sense of security, but I didn't realize that I was helping them with new beginnings as well. So, say, what do you think he meant by saving? Like- so um, there was some. My, my biological mother at that time had some medical issues that I, I wasn't aware of, and. Uh, my parents and myself and some close friends of ours and my coworkers at Tech Systems uh, did a donation of giving money for medical supplies and medical care to whomever would need it in the village, mm-hmm. and um, it ended up going to my parents and my biological or to my biological mother and and to my brothers and to uh, some other people in the village, and so that care it would have been um, equivalent to if someone had given, you know, if someone were a celebrity and they had some rare disease and needed the absolute best care available. That's yeah. basically um, the equivalent of, of what uh, past coworkers and friends and family had donated gave my biological mother that care, and it did help save her life, Yeah, which I didn't know at that time, you know. It's incredible. And so it was incredible that, yes, you know, she she gave me up to save my life, and then I was able to return to help save her life. Mm-hmm. Which was powerful, and yeah. uh, my, you know, I was moved, and, and my, my biological family was very moved, but my parents were moved as well, and so they they went back um, after that trip. They went back a year later to visit, and they now uh, they run a faith based nonprofit, and they help take. They live in the Congo now. Actually, they moved there about a year ago, and now they take care of my biological mother and my brothers. And with the, the help of my parents and some other locals from the village, last year I was able to buy her a house. So she's incredible. no longer no longer living in a mud hut. Um, she's safe. She's doing well. She's healthy. And that really propelled my drive for diversity and inclusion even more. Yeah. I think I needed that uh, that secure of knowing where I came from. Yeah. Um, to to continue on with that work and. Yeah. 
So your experience with your mother and that, that dramatic experience really, you were just saying, really drove you towards your current career. It which did. Which is fully immersed in the world of... Diversity and inclusion. And I knew that would have to take something really, really great and something that would provide the opportunity to make history in order for me to move on from tech. Yeah. And that was the opportunity at Founders. And when you look at the beer industry and you look at the technology industry, there's a lot of similarities. In technology, a lot of the challenges that I was helping to solve um, internally with our offices and also with our clients was that the industry historically has been this industry that was focused on and built from uh, white men, who, oftentimes who had beards, oftentimes, um, you know, looking historically with, from an education standpoint, there wasn't a push for women, um, you know, looking at the 70s and the 80s and even the 90s, there wasn't this push for women um, to go into STEM careers. Very similar to beer, also do- heavily in, uh, an industry dominated by white males with beards, <laughs> There was Every a, brewer I know <laughs> has a long, long, bushy beard. It, it's the trend. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry, I won't have a beard. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, it was. It's also an industry that wasn't uh, promoted to other people. That wasn't promoted to women, or it wasn't promoted to people of color, or to the LGBT community. And I realized that there was this an incredible opportunity. One to be focused in my backyard. Literally, I live right downtown. But to be in an industry um, that needs this work, to get in uh, and at a groundbreaking position um, with an so founders is, is the fastest craft brewery in the United States, and it's the eighth largest craft brewery, uh, I believe, in, in the world, if yeah. not in the United States. And so they have been. I think we take them for granted in our backyard because they they started here and we've watched them grow year after year. Yes. But you forget about their impact until you travel. And, <laughs> and you, you see, see it their, everywhere. You see their beer on every tap and, you know, almost any city you could go to, they're in Europe. It's yeah, uh, amazing. Yeah, they're that all this, over. Yeah, it came out of that. So but, they yeah. are, um, they're currently in 48 states across the United States. They also distribute to South America, um, to your point, all over Europe, um, also to Northern Africa. They're all over China. They're in Australia and they're in New Zealand. And the opportunity um, of diversity and inclusion is very common in technology. Technology has learned that in order to create a better product and um, to to create higher performance levels, they need to to diversify uh, the workforce and also include those who are there in order to provide a seat at the table and to have that representation of those at the table matter. Right. And now beer, you're seeing beer just starting to be right. moving in that direction, whereas there aren't other diversity and inclusion directors at other breweries. Yeah, And it's an a, incredible opportunity to be able to help uh, change the face of the industry, Yeah, and um, which will result in uh, higher performance, higher sales, mm-hmm. um, a, a more broad consumer base, and that also will result in more people wanting to work there. When you see, yeah, it's people talent who, attraction. Yeah, yeah, when you see sure. people who look like you, yeah. um, drinking that beer, that's going to attract uh, more of a broad audience instead of only seeing or associating with one demographic. Right. And so the opportunity now is is incredible to be on the forefront of of making that history. But beer has always been kind of, I think, this sort of you know, this regional thing, you make it in your garage, you can make it for just your family if you want, Mm -hmm. you know? And, um, and there was something, I don't know, I don't want to go down a rabbit hole, but it seems kind of like the craft beer, especially sort of was born out of this interest and hobby that sort of like became a bigger passion. Yes. But it tended to be, you know, basically white dudes that wanted to tinker with this stuff and make their own beer. Mm Mm-hmm. And then it grew from there, but there wasn't really, it was kind of an accidental thought that it would be scaled across, <laughs> you know, the entire 48 states and around the world. Right. And you don't really, yeah, anyway, it was just kind of a side weird thought, but it was just, technology maybe has had to do talent recruitment and things because they had cultural and cultural barriers mm-hmm. to getting their products to market or developing them in a certain language or 
keyboards or, you know, I'm always going back to computers. Right. But does that seem like a fair assessment or not really? Yes, definitely. It, it's, it's very much so. It's very similar in beer as well, especially when you're now your consumer base is across the world. So if you are, are trying to reach the, those consumers and attract that talent and build the brand, your brand needs to be reflective of those who are across the world as well. Sure. Because that's how it goes back to you know, my original love of psychology and that, that emotional connection. And, and that's, you know, it's funny, sometimes people say, you know, your degree is just for your piece of paper and you're never going to use it again. And thank you, Grand Valley. I actually use my degree every day uh, yeah. because now, um, essentially, I still am in, in advertising. It's just a different sense. It's with people yeah. and with the consumers. And you need to have that emotional connection and you need to focus on inclusion and you know, including others and have, having voices represented mm-hmm. um, in order to build uh, that, that base that's going to help you continue yeah. to grow. There needs to be connection. Yeah. And that connection is the outlet to be out of the pillar or the platform to be able to build upon those relationships. One of the things and one of the aspects that I'm most excited about in this role uh, is, is building upon those relationships also that I have that, that tie into the intersectionalities of diversity that I have. Mm-hmm. So building uh, those relationships within people of color communities, building within the queer, you know, the LGBTQ communities, um, building those relationships with the millennials, you know, um, and, and those connections and those relationships, then yes, that ultimately um, there's an opportunity that that can turn into commerce. But before that, it's just about understanding those groups, understanding, you know, what makes people think, what motivates them, um, how do they like to celebrate? Do they want to celebrate with beer? And if so, what kind of beer? Mm-hmm. Or maybe they don't celebrate uh, by drinking, but... Right. But there isn't a way to understand that unless you have those connections and, and allow those voices to be heard. It's all listening, right? It is, yes. Well, here's a cheesy segue. I've enjoyed listening to you, Gracie, <laughs> today on my first podcast. Oh, Brian, thank, thanks so much for having me. You know, it's, uh, I always it's, been, end, it's incredible. Though, was there anything you thought you would say that we didn't get into? And I know we could get, I feel like I could have you back 10 times and we could talk about different stuff all the time. But was there anything that maybe we didn't dip into or cover that you thought was important or thoughts um, that I might no, have cut I, you off nothing, because I'm an amateur Nothing um, necessarily, but I do want to re-highlight on, you know, you and I first met because I was a receptionist sitting at the front desk. And the way that I am now in the position that I'm in was because I had other people who were in leadership roles who believed and the power of diversity, and who believed in the power of authenticity. And me being able to be my authentic self, supported by leadership in an inclusive environment, truly has enabled me to endless opportunities. Mm-hmm. And uh, my personal journey, uh, I, I hope for, for others listening who felt like, uh, who felt like there wasn't uh, you know, a, a career path or whether it's career-related or not, but who may have been uh, frustrated or felt stumped and in, in where they're at currently, um, just don't give up. You know, I, Someone recently asked me what, what I think the definition of success is. And to me, the definition of it, success is giving it all you have, even when you think you have nothing left, and not giving up. So for those out there listening to this, um, follow your passion and don't give up and give it all you have even when you think you have nothing left. That's amazing. Or sometimes even when you're hit by a car <laughs> and you go to a job fair on crutches. Yes, don't give up. <laughs> Never give up. Well, that's the best final word. I can. I, thank you so much for coming. For one, it's an honor to take your portrait and I can't wait to share that with people because you're such an amazing subject and beautiful and I can't wait to project that portrait out into the world so people can see another part of you that they don't already see online and um, and share this conversation. So thank you, Gracie. I can't wait to see you around town as I know I will. Thanks, Brian. This has been an incredible experience. I appreciate you having me. Yeah.